This is the Absolute Business Mindset podcast, created and hosted by Mark Hayward. This podcast will interview entrepreneurs, business owners, and people in their careers. We will delve into their journey to success, key life milestones, and go deep into their area of expertise. Get ready to learn from other successes and failures. Today, we have Solvay Biddle, who is an award-winning entrepreneur, business consultant, inspirational leadership expert, lawyer, and public speaker. Solvay, thank you very much for joining me today. Oh, it's absolutely fine, Mark. Thank you for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. So um, let's dive straight into it. Um, I always start with people's education just to get a grounding because I find it interesting to see how people move from their education into their career slash business. Yeah. So you initially did an economics degree at University of London. Yeah, so was right. was it very business focused? Um, yeah, actually, it was more theoretical now that I think about it. Um, I think we did look at you sort of start with the kind of microeconomics and then the macroeconomics. Yeah. I'd always been uh, very interested in sort of global economies and emerging markets and all that sort of stuff. And also how um, environmental issues could be solved using uh, economic theory. So that's what I wrote my dissertation on. Um, hadn't thought about that for quite a while. Um, and um, yeah, so it was, it was fairly theoretical, but I suppose that grounding uh, of, of economics and how things work and how money moves around, mm-hmm. how money moves around is, is, was a great sort of foundation for other things that I ended up doing it, doing, and actually I loved, I did economics as an A-level and I, and I really liked it. So it was a very sort of natural progression to do that as a degree. Well, that's very interesting. Um, and, and then you went to, to College of Law. So yes. so I went to law school after that. So, so, um, so, so how come, what, what, why? Well, the, to, again, to... interesting one, because while I was at university, I had actually done some work, the World Wildlife Fund um, in Madagascar. And I was working on a, herpetology project looking for new species of snakes and geckos and all that kind of stuff and I'd actually been sponsored by Rio Tinto Zinc and I was very much heading down the road in my mind of being an economist or similar Mm -hmm. and um, just in that last year of university I thought about where I thought my skills would be would be best would be best used Mm -hmm. and um, I've always liked to be able to uh, help others solve problems and I think that law came up as a as an idea and as a, as an opportunity and uh, so I applied to the College of Law and, and managed to get a, a place there at Guildford which was great so I had to do a conversion course so I did a year what they call CPE it's all a bit different now but that's a, the common professional examination so that was a three-year law degree in one year very intensive course um, and then actually during that time I had decided I was going to be a barrister um, rather than a solicitor, uh, but financial things meant that I decided to go and get a training contract. Um, you have to, it, it's quite difficult to earn money uh, quickly being a barrister, and I didn't have a huge amount of finance behind me, so I decided that I would be a solicitor, and I managed to get a training contract during my second year of law school, so that really helped out, and then I started working, um, I started training in 1995, so um, yeah, and then thirteen years in law. So, so before we go into it, just so was that was was your decision to do economics and then law, which are quite traditional sort of subjects to do? Was that was that influenced by your upbringing, by your family, or was that was it something that you were driving? That that um, very subjects? much something I was driving. Um, actually, my parents are archaeologists, oh. so they couldn't they couldn't <laughs> be more different. Um, but I suppose I'd always grown up in a but academic background because um, they're both um, professors. So that it was that sort of work hard, use your brain um, and you know do what you can uh, to, to really follow what you want to do. So I suppose they were always really encouraging of if you want to make something happen, you can do it. But it wasn't the sort of thing where, you know, I had to really think about how I was gonna finance all of this. And, um, so no, it was very much, very much my doing. But no, I haven't followed an economist or followed a lawyer in, into into the job. And then of course I ended up doing things that were completely different. But we'll get on to that later. Yeah, we'll but yeah. so, you, so you spent thirteen years in the city as yeah. a lawyer. So 
what was that experience like? Was it was it exciting? Was it was it um, like because it, it obviously you you were, were you doing corporate law at that stage? Okay, so when you're training, you you train in various different areas. So you do corporate, you do some company commercial, you do conveyancing, which is property law and litigation. So you do a whole load of different stuff. Um, and but I specialised um, as soon as I had qualified. I specialised in branding intellectual property and advertising law so I very much went into that sort of that area whereby people with interest with ideas and concepts how do they protect them how do they then take them forward so it was the sort of within the auspices of, of company commercials so a number of brands that are out there today I, I remember being involved in the early days of protecting their ideas mm. um, protecting their names you've got the trademarks you've got um, patents all that sort of thing and then how do they how do they build their company with their shareholders and and you know the responsibilities and shareholdings and partnership all these sorts of things so actually from quite early on in my legal career I was involved with people who had a kind of entrepreneurial mind because if you're going to if someone's got an idea and it needs protecting that idea has come from an individual yeah. And so you're all very lots and lots of interaction with um, with companies um, who are being quite innovative. Um, so some of the early um, online streaming channels like Napster and people like that, um, as well as um, as actual brands that are on the high street today and that sort of thing. So no, I really enjoyed it, uh, and it was really hard work. Uh, definitely isn't one for. Uh, sort of you know sitting on your laurels so it was hard work but I met really uh, good and fun people who are still friends today um, and I think a lot of about working is it also does have to be fun and I very much instill that now when I do my uh, consultancy because you know I think you can't you won't have longevity with something if you don't also find it Absolutely. It, it will just be an, a, a constant slog so no I did really enjoy it um, but uh, ultimately I and you know I had an idea and I wanted to take that forward but I would say that the foundation of that legal training that knowledge you it, it's something that's always with you and sometimes I, I I think I don't even realize that I'm using it that knowledge and information I think certainly going forward and in my negotiations that I needed to do for my own business mm -hmm. it was absolutely key that I had done these things before and had that confidence I think to be able to go forward and and um ensure that you know I got the deal that I felt I needed to get so very useful yeah yeah I I, I worked in the big four uh, PwC and KPMG for 15 years and um and I I've now struck out and and, and do my own thing um but I think it's a for me it was a really good grounding spending sort of 15 years in a very professional environment um and I, I i can tell by looking at you how you're speaking you 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 come across as very professional very very competent i think that that there's similar traits in being a lawyer it gives you such a good grounding of of how to conduct business that people people will come to you and people will respond to you because of yeah i mean i think uh, a lot of it and i'm sure it's exactly the same with you um having been in the big four is that there's also that sense of credibility you know when you're going out and you're on your own and and you're you're forging your way in a completely new area of um of business and life and uh if you have no background and no experience in it really the selling point is yourself of course your idea mm. but you can have the best idea in the world but i often say to people if you walk in somewhere like a dog's breakfast you're never going to get anywhere in the first place so yeah. it's about you as you as a person, as well as the concepts and ideas that you want to take forward. Because as I say, early on, particularly when you don't, you know, you don't have a whole range of products that you've done in the past or a range of services that you've set up. And uh, it, it is about you and it's about people being able to believe in you and that you'll be able to make it happen. So yeah. I do think that comes a lot from the backgrounds that we've been talking about. I, th I think business is is based on people. Uh, like you can have a great idea, but it, it, if if you are not credible, then people won't invest in you. So I I, I think exactly because that's and and I often think um, 
I was doing an interview the other day and it was about the challenges of lockdown and it was about the challenges that we are going to be facing in the next 12 months, 18 months, God forbid, longer than that. Um, but about, you know, how much harder it's going to be to raise money and to, to do the things that um, ult ultimately entrepreneurs need, need to be able to do to move things forward. And we really were talking about that, that credibility, that tenacity that you have to have. And it, it's so down to the individual and the rapport that you can build. And even more than ever, we, ha we have to really recognize that, but also bringing in those other soft skills like empathy and really being able to understand and put yourself in the shoes of the people that you're trying to engage. Because, you know, I often say, well, imagine what would you want to hear if it was you being asked to take on the product in a new store or, or stock it online or, or asking for money to take a business forward? What, what would you want to, to know about that person or about the product or whatever? And really try and think about those things and, and engage those skills of rapport and empathy and everything. And, I, and a lot of people have had a really tough time um, in the last year. So I, I just think we all need to be really aware of that. But there are opportunities there too. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think you're absolutely right. I think empathy is is such a crucial skill for in business, which is sometimes underrated because um, people just think that you, you you want the profit margins. But actually, there's as I said, there's people in business and 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 if they're even if they're clients, customers or or even employees, they're, they're all people you need to connect with and build yeah. rapport with and 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 establish relationships with people because that's that's what business is absolutely thank you okay so so then you be you 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 were the founder and ceo of content and calm now were you uh did you have that as a side hustle for a while while you were still as a lawyer or was there a definite shift you you said one day actually i want to do my own thing i'm going to move over to to my own business well, that's an interesting one, Mark, because um, there was certainly a, a moment when I made what I call a change. But before that, while I was working, in fact, when I had the first of my two children, there was something I needed and I assumed I could buy it. I never for a moment thought I wouldn't be able to buy it. And I remember this is sort of early stages of, you know, Googling things. And I remember we were going to go away for the first trip with our daughter um, and she was going to be sharing a room with us. And we had got her into quite a good routine where, you know, she would go to bed with, with darkness, you know, with the blinds shut and what have you. And I was thinking about lunchtime sleeps and I was thinking about maybe we might want to go down for dinner. We were just going to France um, uh, and, you know, we might need a babysitter in the room, but we can't expect the babysitter to sit in the dark while she, you know, so I thought, oh, no problem at all. I'll just buy myself. And in my mind, there was a name for it, which ended up being the name I used for my first product. But, and it's just literally it, it, explanatory. Um, I needed a cot canopy. I needed a canopy that could go over a cot and give personal darkness. Hmm. That's all I needed. Right. And there was no such thing. And I thought, well, there must be something like it. And I ended up going completely off piece I'm thinking, well, there must be something I can use in exchange. And I ended up finding a, a, a sort of mobile dark room that a photographer would use. And I thought, I really lost the plot here. I, I'm not going to be putting that over you know, my baby's cot. So we didn't end up having the cot canopy that we needed. We went on the holiday. But I kept thinking to myself, you know, that this was something that would be really useful. And a lot of my friends were having children at the same time. And I asked them, what do you think? Do you think such a thing would be a useful idea? Yeah, I think that well, they thought that was a great idea. That would be, you know, a, a good thing to have. However, sort of one of the first things I say to people when they have an idea is you really need to evaluate because you might think it's brilliant. And then other people give you that funny side look like, yeah, I'm not so sure. But people seem to like the idea. But we didn't have the product. I went back to work. I had my son. And then we were going away. Um, and we were, again, it was to do with travel. And I've always loved travel and, uh, and wanted the kids to want to be able to move around with them. And we were going to a place in Cornwall and they were going to share a room. Now, by this point, my daughter needed the light to get to the loo because she was getting out of the bed. But my son um, was in the cot and was literally one of those sort of Duracell bunnies that the light comes on and he is ready to go. It could be two in the morning. I'm ready to go. Jumping up and down on the cot. 
and he actually he learned how to launch himself out as well um and would sort of appear you know in our room um anyway so <laughs> i really needed it again at that point and i thought there must be something there so this is the point where i did some evaluation so i was still working but um we really had got to sort of two months before i ended up doing what i call sort of making that that stock change that you need to do to make something happen because once <coughs> excuse me once i'd done the evaluation and that involved speaking to people who actually would be those decision makers so um people like midwives who would have a, a view on whether keeping that continuity and darkness which would give parents confidence and things like that um also nurseries where they might have lots of children in a room um and parents and and and, and some early sort of thoughts with people I knew in retail, you know, is this something? And I got to the point where I thought, do you know what, there's enough here. And I think I always had the desire to do something different. So I enjoyed law, I enjoyed what I was doing, but I was now very much along the path of, this is something that I think I can do and something I can take to market, which was quite interesting. Bear in mind, I'd never designed a product before in my life. I had absolutely no idea about manufacturing or actually at retail in it. In apart from the sense that I had worked with brands and I'd done the sort of legal side, I was very much the consumer like anyone else. You know, I'd go to a shop, find a product on the shelf, look at that. Do I want it? Don't I want it? Put it in your basket. That journey that I then learned, any single thing that you find on the shelf, how it ended up there, it, mm. it's it's so much more protracted than I ever could have thought. <laughs> so I've certainly learned that. So so your canopy and your bag that you, you did as your next product. Yeah. In manufacturing. So where did you get the contacts to? Right. To well, that's sort of the next day. So I say there's the idea, there's evaluation, there's making the change, because ultimately, depending on what you're trying to do, for me, I wanted to try and make this something that would be a brand as in there would be more products. Right. There's no way I could carry on working in law and create something like that. It was all consuming. Yep. Because before even going and doing the manufacturing, I had to think about protecting it. Because yep. at, the, at that time there was, as I said, there were, I couldn't find a product on the market. So I knew it was new and mm. I couldn't find anything globally either. Mm. So it was a whole new concept for which there had to be a, uh, the whole testing manual for this type of product had to be written. And I had to get involved in that with right. just a global testing house. So there was a lot kind of behind it that had to happen first. Mm. Um, but originally I approached UK manufacturers, literally I had no contacts in that area whatsoever. So that's when kind of a bucket load of tenacity starts getting poured in. And I just thought I'm anybody, I thought who might know somebody who might know somebody I asked and people were incredibly helpful. So I asked a lot of different people uh, for any contacts they might have. I had a couple of amazing people who helped me along the way. But initially trying to get the manufacturing done in the UK, to make a long story short, it would never have been able to have been done at the right cost. There wasn't a lot, you know, that the manufacturing of fabrics, the tooling, everything, the product would have been too expensive to make it viable. So I went to China. I knew that I had to do that. Right. And um, did I have any contacts there at the time? No, I didn't. But I um, literally Googled different companies that were making things out in the Far East, right. had a number of conversations with them. And I went to Hong Kong, which is where uh, quite a lot of the manufacturers that, that manufacture on mainland China will have their offices. Mm -hmm. And I sat there with my idea and it was actually quite funny because the thing is Mark, i realized that that was one of the first times where i realized that actually i had gone down a rabbit hole uh, before i got there that and wasted money that i didn't need to spend and that was because in my office when i was still in law do you remember the first holiday where we were going to france i sketched what i wanted on a piece of paper and um my assistant who, who i shared a room with um I said to her, look at this. This is the thing I need. And we used to joke about it. She would say, how's it going with your thing? And I'd written copyright on the corner and, you know, with the date um, and what have you. And I thought, in my mind, I thought I needed to go to professional designers to design it properly mm. 
in order to be able to take those drawings to a manufacturer. That was what, in my mind, I needed to do. Right. Um, and, you know, the designers were very happy to go along with that because I spoke to a number of different designers and it cost me a lot of money. And ultimately, I ended up with, with just snazzier versions of my rather hopeless sketch. Um, but the rather hopeless sketch was all that they needed. Oh, uh, really? Because so... what was so amazing was that energy and that willingness to really listen there um, with the manufacturing. So the head of manufacturing um, at the factory I ended up going with, he, he could visualize my concept. He could understand that there would need to be a clamp that would need to go on the cot to attach the canopy. And those bits that were so important um, hadn't really, hadn't even been done in the drawings that I spent all the money on. Anyway, the long and the short of, I, and every product I did after that, I sketched and I discussed with them. And That's we, interesting. It's interesting because manufacturing, I, I, <laughs> I would have thought as, a, as, as the industry, not, not nowhere near an expert in manufacturing, but I would have thought manufacturing would have been very much, these are the dimensions right. that I need. These are the, the, the size, the shape. Mm. The, these right. are the extra pieces that I need. Yeah. I, I wouldn't have thought, I wouldn't have thought, the manufacturing would have been creative enough to have taken it from your your well, sketch. What was so amazing is, as I say, the, and and um, the guy that I worked with for many years on my initial products, um, uh, his his name, well, the name he gave is Man King, Manufacturing King. But I mean, that wasn't actually his name. But I think that the point was there was so much willingness to sort of think outside the box and really understand also what, because he had his manufacturing hill, he knew what the factories could do. Mm. So, you know, they, they would help a design or an idea come to life. Mm. Um, and they would use whichever of their manufacturing, you know, factories mm. would be right. So some of my stuff was, I, I in the end had five different factories making different things. Because some, sometimes it was more fabric based, some of it was more tooling based. You know, in the idea of tooling, I had never, I had no concept of it at all. And I learned, I had to learn so quickly. Um, but being out there, so, and so the long, my big smart drawings that were in a, a, a you know, a role that I, I brought out sort of got pushed to one side and my original sketch was there and it was all about the conversation. So I think that was a really interesting thing that happened there. And in going forward, there was a lot of joint discussion about Sort of what I what I was trying to achieve, how I wanted to achieve it, um, and and taking it you know to that level. So yeah, it involved going to China. I went to all the factories myself on mainland China. So I would go with Nanking, or if I was using a different factory, somebody else. Um, I would meet the factory owners. I would see where the workers lived because you've got to remember that when you want to sell to, to retail, whether it was UK retail or international distributors or international retailers, um, you have to have done that due diligence to know that, that the conditions in the factories are right. Um, you, you know, as a, as a supplier, you know, your supplier agreements with UK retailers, this, this was no simple thing. It was complicated and, and you took on a lot of liability uh, and actually, so it was really important. So, I actually, but that rapport that we talked about early on, and and um, really having a connection, the owners of the factories, they were quite surprised that I pitched up um, with my guys from you know Hong Kong, and that I had made the effort to go. But I mean, and some of these were really far inland in China, really yeah. quite remote, yeah. and. Um, it made a difference and it really made a difference when we were up against it with timelines because I had actually gone and they had seen me and I, I often think that they sort of thought who's this sort of half Danish quite you know crazy woman with her ideas coming forward but we had good relationships and it and it worked and it made a difference and and that having the connections there in terms of the rapport that I made made such a difference going forward so, you know, the first product was the cot canopy. There were various different versions of that. Um, by this point, I uh, had various other products in the line, one being, for example, protective shade, which was to do with giving shade in the car. But the product I suppose that most people know me for is Trake It, uh, which is the product that um, 
I know before we started the interview, uh, we talked about uh, having a chat about good old Dragon's Den. Um, but that's that was the product that I took with me. And it was one of those things where it, when I first started inventing things, you know, people think of you and they say, what are you doing? What, you know, you're inventing these products. What are these products? Oh, you should go on Dragon's Den. Because at the time, Dragon's Den, it is still popular, but at the time it was the second most popular program on television after Top Gear. It was huge yeah. Yeah. viewing numbers, 7 million people every, you know, every Sunday or Monday, whatever day it was on. And um, yeah, so people constantly said to me, you should go on Dragon's Den. And I said, no way am I going on Dragon's Den. And I sort of said, and that wasn't because I wasn't up for the challenge, because I am up for a challenge. And if there's a good opportunity, you know, I, I will go and talk about my products and see what I can do. But the problem was, was at that point, before Trake It was, a, was an actual thing, it was an idea in my head at the time, um, the cock canopy was, I, I felt it was too controversial and too complicated to explain in two minutes as well as getting numbers across and all that stuff because ultimately there was some controversiality about it in the sense that you're covering a cot i mean obviously we had done all the testing and everything and it was safe and and all those things but i just felt that when i looked at some back programs of dragon's den um and i wasn't an avid watcher actually but i looked at some back programs uh and anything that was to do with children or baby products there seemed to be quite a vibe at the time of the dragons to dislike anything that made things easier because you should just sort of tough it out. And I remember, <laughs> I remember um, Duncan Ballantyne, great guy. Uh, and but at the, I watched an old program of his, and somebody had come up with a product that would record bedtime stories, and you left it in the cot with the baby, and it would kind of read out a bedtime story. Right. He absolutely hated it. And he said, I hate your idea and I hope you fail. And I was like, oh, blimey. That was, you know, this poor guy who'd come up with this, this talking teddy thing. Um, but the idea, you know, his point was, you know, in my day, we, you know, parents should be involved and all of that sort of thing. So, you know, I knew there was some controversiality about that first product. Anyway, at the time I had, uh, there was a, a lady who was a mum at school and she was doing a bit of part-time PR for me. And we talked about it. She said, you know what? I really think you should do it. I really think you should consider it. And I said, well, I can't go with the cock canopy for all the, the reasons I've just discussed. Um, but I do have an idea in my mind. Uh, and it, this was the trade kit idea. And, and this was, the whole thing happened actually because Dragon's Den contacted me. Their researchers had contacted me initially. I didn't approach them, but that was um, because with the cock canopy product, I had been lucky enough to win uh, a UK Inventors Award the previous summer. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, they look for people who are making things. These aren't obviously the dragons. These are these are the researchers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I said, no. And then they followed up. And I guess they were tenacious too, because they followed up. And by that point, I had been beaten into submission by my PR lady. Um, and I said, well, you know, I do have this product. And blah, blah, blah. anyway, they said, right, send in a submission. And it was a really involved process. It was... It, and the amount of information you had to have, and if you, you couldn't, absolutely, you wouldn't have been able to say you'd had a conversation with a retailer without the, um, you know, the backup. Mm -hmm. But of course, you're not just going on with one product. If you had one product that you wanted to promote, you had to talk about the whole brand. So I knew that they would, and ultimately that credibility that we talked about would come from me already having sales in my, with my first product. Um, and that had come from doing an initial trade fair where I had begged for contacts at shops like Mother Care and managed to persuade them to come and see me. And they came in a scary manner and sort of rattled at my prototype that was made of paper mache, basically. Um, and luckily it didn't fall apart and, and I did get sales from that. So that was a whole kind of different story about having that first trade fair and really being out kind of in the ether. Um, but with Dragon's Den, they said, you know, do a submission. I did a submission. And then I got a call saying, and this was, say, on a Monday, and they, I got a call saying, right, for a, um, a, a sort of tester interview uh, or, you know, presentation the following Thursday. So, you know, one minute, I had no product. You know, it was an idea. And so I kind of had to go and pretend as if I was going to do something. Um, and, uh, yeah, they liked that. Uh, the, I guess the way I talked about it, I, you know, I did a pitch. Of course, it wasn't my 
total final point. Um, but then what happened was um, I remember coming out of a meeting with the bank because at that point I was, you know, had, was bank finance. You know, I was going to say, how did you find? Yeah, it? so I'll, I'll tell you about that. But I came out of a meeting uh, with HSBC and I got a phone call, and um, it was the people, the researcher people from from Dragons Den saying, and this was a uh, this was I think a Tuesday and a week on the following Thursday or similar they said, right, you're up against the dragons you selected. And as brilliant as that sounds, I didn't have a product. I didn't have anything to show. Mm. And this is where actually that relationship that I had with the factory in China couldn't have been more important because I got straight on the phone to Man King and said, good Lord, you know that thing I sketched out for you? Well, I'm going to be on TV with it. Um, I don't know how it's going to go, but we need a prototype. And we endlessly talked on the phone about what to do. He was sending me pictures. I was then amending back and forth. You know, there was no, there was no Zoom like we're doing now. Do you know what I mean? You know, it, yeah. it was all over the phone and, and I would sketch something and, and then I would email it to him. And then he would sketch something and email it back. Mm. Anyway, the long and the short is the um, prototype sample turned up the morning I left to be filmed. <laughs> That night you couldn't have scripted it so, could you? you know it, it was really <laughs> touch and go really touch and go um no. because you you you, I, you stay in a hotel the night before uh, and so the day i left it arrived and it was anyway so that was very touch and go but as it happened you know you are you are risking you're risking you know to go out there and to promote your brand you've got these two minutes but you know i i knew my numbers i had done the homework I put the time, I, I really, really put the time in to know mm -hmm. what I was going to say. And so, so uh, at the start, did you create a business plan? I assume you needed it if you were going to do uh, finance through a bank. Yes. So, well, I'd sort of already, I'd already done that because my, my first, uh, the crop canopy was already selling. So I sold, I had, you know, Mother Care and a few other retailers at that point. Um, so I had, you know, in terms of sort of being professional and kind of knowing what, what I have, my, you know, my projections. Um, yes, I had put quite a lot of work in, but in terms of, and actually the way that it was structured in terms of what you had to produce to, to even go on the programme, um, you know, it really made you focus your mind. So it was, a, it was a good thing, but it was a huge amount of work. And had it gone south, I'm not so sure I'd be saying the same thing now, um, but uh, it, it did go well. And um, yeah, it was one of those experiences that you, you can't, you sort of can't make up because I, you, you're in a room with all the people who are going to be filmed that day and everybody was going one by one and you don't know, you, you know, you're oh, waiting your turn. And I was the last person, I was the last person there. And, and I was thinking, oh my gosh, one. And it was, uh, I got, you You get there at about seven in the morning from the hotel and they brought me in uh, for filming at about 6.37 in the evening. It was a very long day, just yeah. waiting, waiting yeah. practicing, waiting. So, so, so you got the deal with Peter Jones and Deborah Mead and how mm. long was that relationship um active like how much involvement did they have in your uh, in running your business yeah and, so um yeah i mean on the actual day i got four offers and negotiated to go with the maze which, which was quite fun um and peter jones said something he said he had never done before he didn't ask me any questions and after an hour of me being grilled by the others he said, I've never done this before. I'm not going to ask you any questions and I'm going to offer you all the money. I saw it. I saw so that was quite it. Cool. Amazing. Um, so, yeah, they, you know, they were great. And um, so they, because it was a joint thing, um, I actually sort of had more involvement with Deborah, actually. Um, and although, you know, Peter was sort of in the background. Um, so, you know, I think it depends on how much you had already done. I've actually already done quite a lot with what mm. I was doing. Mm. Uh, and in terms of, particularly that summer, so I did the filming, but obviously you can't tell anyone what's happened, but I'm meeting with them in the background, mm. you know, Deborah and Peter. Um, and I'm also, uh, and this is the reality of it, I know it's gone well. I don't know whether it's the sort of, whether it's the best of that series or anything like that, but what I was very aware of was that I needed some product. So you remember I'd gone in with that one prototype. Yeah. But if they were to show the program in, say, week three, which might have been at the end of 
July and I was filmed in May mm. and I didn't have any product, that's completely wasted opportunity. Yeah, so yeah. the first thing I actually did was go to China. So as soon mm. as I'd done the filming, I went to China yeah. and we worked, we basically worked on the product until it was good enough to be gold sealed where you go through all the testing and all of this sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. See, and we did have to air freight some and just didn't know when the program would show so you know you, you we had to be ready so you know there was obviously involvement and um at that point but i i mean i did have some investors before i went on the program um and that was sort of very enthusiastic family and friends who wanted to get involved yeah. um and i also had bank finance so i mean i had gone for bank finance before i knew i was going to be dragon's den because right. you know obviously i didn't know that i was going to do that yeah. and i'd say HS hsbc were very helpful they were very good in the sense that they um rather it's you know you think you need a sum of money you go in there you justify why you need that money but actually we created a sort of setup whereby there were part of it was export finance. So that's very useful um, because effectively they would pay for your manufacturing. You then had a certain amount of time to pay uh, while it was being manufactured and shipped right. into the UK and sold, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> hopefully sold to somebody else. Um, so those were the sort of big challenges, um, you know, doing all of that. And then, uh, and actually kind of when the program did eventually air, it turned out that I was the last series the last program of the whole series right um, and it was a bit of a sort of you know wow kind of thing which I was so pleased about um and I remember sitting with some of my investors and my lawyers when the program was aired you know we just didn't know what was going to happen and I remember being interviewed on BBC Five Live that night and and you know, all sorts of things happened afterwards all sorts of things and you know there was a lot of uh, there was a huge amount of demand and retailers that I wasn't really with wanted to be involved so you know that was all super exciting but I, I'm going to be honest you know there were lots of challenges with that too because as much as you know as a supplier and, and things have changed a bit now because actually suppliers had a bit of a raw deal um in terms of your contract with certain retailers not, mm. not all but some mm. um and um you know you would you had to commit to being able to send, sell a lot of product without getting paid for sort of 90 days at least you know this is a huge amount of risk going on here mm -hmm. and minimum order quantities in the far east so this is all a learning curve so i'm just learning all the time quick 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 thinking right okay what are the right decisions to make what more can i take on can you know how many uh, are we still at, at the background of all of this there are other product lines coming up different colorways different mm -hmm. additions uh, to all of these products um and things like that so there are a lot of challenges there, and um, this is all sort of 2011, around then there were a lot of challenges in the high street, so I wasn't just selling to on uh, to bricks and mortar retail, I was selling online as well, on my own website, mm. but also I'd started international trade by this point, so um, I had been to a very big trade show called Kinten Jorgent in Germany, and I did that three or four times. Um, and have picked up some really good international distributors and um, things like that. So, you know, all of this is going on um, and, you know, you, you've got responsibilities to your to your investors. You've obviously got your banking people. You've got your employees, you know, and, and really sort of it felt quite quickly that what I started it to do was come up with ideas and make things and and do things that would be useful and, and mm. make traveling with children easier that was the whole point mm. you know mm. Um, mm. to make traveling with children easier you end up you've got so many different entities involved that you're spending less time doing the designing and more time doing the HR well process. when you scale a business you you have to build in processes and systems don't you to to be successful so it's Absolutely. it's not it's not it, it, that's how you actually get to the larger scale and being yeah. able to do with bigger business and i always say you know never ever be afraid to employ somebody who is better than you knows mm. more than you mm. uh, because as much as you think you might be good in one area you probably don't know enough in another area mm. um and so you know bringing in the right people but also recognizing where your own skills are mm. because 
ultimately, you know, my skill was just partly designing it, but, you know, there were lots of other good people around who would make things better, you know, help to tweak things. But very much on the sales side, I was a good salesperson for my own products. And I did um, a lot of partnerships, which were, which was such an interesting thing to do because, you know, ultimately I was a small brand and um, a sort of new thing, a new brand. What are these, what are these products? But I managed to get them into most sort of UK retailers and, you know, they were selling around the world and things like that. But, but actually, um, when you're when you're bringing in a new brand, it's great to team up with somebody else who is in that space, mm. um, has similar customers of mm. the sort that you think, um, and can really help your profile. So I had a couple of really nice tie ups with British Airways, which was just fantastic. They were so so willing to listen to new ideas, and we did mm. some fab photo shoots with them with new planes before they'd even flown. And mm. my kids, I always rolled my kids out as models holding the products and things like that. Um, so those were the things I did some things with charity. Um, I'm now on the development board of um, an ovarian cancer charity yes, and I had gone involved with them and would, you know, we did commercial participation agreements with them. So, you know, bringing in other parties and third parties that, that actually can help it's only about leveraging your own brand, but just give, just has the right, um, fit. Yeah. You know, so when I work with other people now, I talk about partnerships. I talk about that sort of, you know, the side of ch with charities, the philanthropic side of things. What are you doing in terms of, you know, because, of course, you can have the best idea in the world. And we talked about this before we started. But also, um, if, if, if people don't know about it and you haven't done the right thing in terms of your marketing and your PR, you're not going to get anywhere. People have to know what the product is. They have to see it. They've got to be able to feel it. And um, that isn't always about pitfall number two, about spending a huge amount of money with big expensive PR companies, because you can waste huge amounts of money on sort of advertising that doesn't do anything. It's like, what does engage people? And I think a lot of that is, is being in those places and, um, where where your customers ultimately engage so mm. sort of things we we uh you know sold product via also virgin atlantic and things like that so you know it's all travel it's mm. travel related mm. um and you know it's being in the the, ma the magazines that people would read in, on who was your ideal client for your tray did you did you British did you with my no, ideal client no no, no I, I mean as in your <laughs> ideal client as oh, the, the individual the yeah the individual so the whole purpose of this product, and I remember when I did my Dragon's Den pitch, I had been that person where, so your kids, when you travel with kids, they want things to play with. And that can be in the car, it can be on a plane, it can be on a train, and they'll normally have a little backpack and they'll get everything out, right? And that can be little dinosaurs, little characters, puzzle pieces, all this kind of stuff. And they will get it all out and they'll put it in their lap or they'll put it on a tray table on a plane or in a train and it all falls off and, it, and some things fall down and you're driving and the dinosaur's fallen on the floor and your child says, I need, I've dropped my dinosaur. And you say, well, we'll just have to wait. And they know my dinosaur and their children are really tenacious as well. And you end up leaning backwards, trying to pick yes. stuff up. And I had that same thing with being on the plane where things rolling down the aisle and what have you. And I thought, well, hang on a minute. What about if you had a backpack that they that they carry for themselves, pet everything in, and then play within it? And that was the idea. So, so your ideal client, parents. your ideal client was you. You were so the ideal client was me. I was the person who needed it, but there were lots of people like me. Yes. And if you go the days when we used to be able to travel, that's the thing, not. But you remember, you would often see if you saw children that were able to walk, how many would have a little backpack with yeah, yeah. stuff? Yeah. Yeah. But the point is they get it all out and, yeah. and, and then it doesn't stay within. And this is an extended tray table and the strap now is take it, pack it, strap it. And so it straps to the airline tray table or it hangs from the seat in front of the car and they can play within. So it was a, a travel parent, but that didn't mean it didn't have to be airline travel. Yeah. A, a parent that's moving from A to B and yeah. wherever that might be. And for the child to take responsibility of choosing what to play with, putting it in their, tra in their tray kit, playing within it, shutting it at the end of the journey and off they go. So it was 
anybody who has children who's going to go from A to B. Yeah. Of which or, there seem to be quite a lot of people. Yes, I think there were, I, I, obviously there, there, there was, and, 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 and it's definitely been a success for you. So you, you started, I'm going to move on, you started at Inspiration, Inspirational Solutions. Yes. So, so how, how did you sort of okay. think about yeah. that? And Yeah, so um, what, during the time of, of, of creating all these projects we've just talked about, uh, because it was a, a story, I suppose, of a real story of somebody taking an idea and taking it from in their head in the shops. It was a real story of somebody who had no experience in one area and managed to do it. So during that time, I was doing a fair amount of public speaking and being asked by other companies, could you come and do a sort of motivational talk at our AGM or whatever it might be, but also can you look at our product? Could you have a look at what we're doing here? What do you think about expanding into that market? Mm -hmm. um, and I absolutely loved and thrived on being able to share my experience with others and hopefully help them to avoid some pitfalls, but also to encourage and, and keep, you know, to, to give that motivation to keep going and to have that positivity and that tenacity. So it had all started during the days of the product manufacturing and the retail and the distribution. Um, and I just found that I really did enjoy that um, very much and that people seemed to get something out of it. And um, by this point, I had sort of I hadn't seen my children very much for the last eight years, really hard work. Mm -hmm. um, and so I decided to, to sort of make that into a, a formal sort of consultancy business where people can, I can either do, you know, I go in and do programs for companies where I'll do a sort of from in your head to in the shops or inspiring creativity, innovation, encouraging your workforce, just to really, let's get these ideas mixing mm. um, and, and helping companies build their brands as well as helping individuals to be leaders in what they're doing, whether that's motivating uh, people themselves or um, leadership that they might have because they're, they're in the service sector and doing other, other, other things. So, um, so it's really about uh, sort of, three things. It's about going out and doing the public speaking, which, which I do. It's about um, the consultancy, looking at the brands, looking at the businesses and looking at the people. Um, and uh, thirdly, as I say, really focusing on that inspirational leadership and, and helping people to take their ideas and concepts and people forward. How many employees do you have with Inspirational Solutions? None. Me. It's just you. You literally, you. you I literally do it. I so I. Well, all the admin as well, all the arranging yeah, of things. I, they're not employees, but I have people. You know, I outsource right, things yeah, like yeah. um, you know, financial PAs and, and PAs and, like and things. But yeah. no, in terms of actually doing the work, and I might do it in collaboration. So I might think, right, I've got a client that um is in this sector, but actually I know someone who's really good in that. I might work on the leadership side of things with the people or the brand or the um, building an export business but I know other people in that so a lot of it's about partnerships a lot of it's about finding the right solutions for clients where they are really able to tap into that knowledge and that has come from years of going out to businesses meeting other people who are sort of in that sector of being entrepreneurial things and all the people I met along my journey um a lot of the international things and really sort of bringing heads together really bringing heads together and thinking right what does somebody need it, you know is it is it do I have that right expertise or do I bring in somebody else who's got that expertise but essentially I it, it's a consultancy and and you know I focus on what my clients need and that's what I do now so how do you market for your consultancy oh, lots of different ways okay so um quite often uh I will actually be approached um and that comes from I suppose it's that credibility thing that we came from from having done the hard slog you know at, in the past I have, you know, I've been a judge on, I was a judge on the pitch after I did Dragon's Den. So there's been quite a lot of um, publicity around some of the things that I've done. Um, and also I find things like LinkedIn really useful. 
I reach out to people who are in similar sectors. People reach out to me. I do quite a lot of interviews, <laughs> hence yep, talking with you. Are, yeah. <laughs> um, so sometimes I'm, I'm on a panel or sometimes it's a podcast. Um, and so I would say that it's about connections. Almost everything is about connections. And that doesn't mean to say that I always need to pe- know the person in advance. I might reach out to somebody or I'll see somebody talking about something that they're trying to do. Um, I am a mentor for um, an an international organization that mentors females uh, in tech. So I do stuff with that. Um, I do stuff with young enterprise as well. So, you know, it's one of these things where being active, being willing to share my ideas, being vocal and interactive Mm. actually brings in people who also have things that they're wanting to, to achieve. So it really comes from all of that. And the world we're living in at the moment, where we spend half our time on Zoom, yeah. I mean, normally I'm a real face-to-face person. I absolutely love seeing somebody face-to-face, having a coffee, meeting new people that I haven't done anything with before. Um, and, you know, particularly when I do public speaking and things like that, I often meet so many people through that. But now we do so much online. And actually, um, the more that means you need to i think reach out more i think you yeah. need to be more interactive i'm sure you find the same with your podcast yeah. and and the more we do the more we share our ideas and the more ideas we share actually you know i i, I think the more um sort of gratifying the whole experience is to be able to help more people and uh, and to really be able to move things forward and i think we're going to have to carry on in that vein actually for quite yeah. a long time yeah i agree i agree even with the vaccine in the uk I know. Yes. Well, let's hope that let's hope that as many people as possible get, get vaccinated yes. and that, that actually people feel confident. I'm, you know, one of the things that concerns me uh, is is people's confidence, actually, yeah. moving forward, confidence to have their kids in school, confidence to to be entrepreneurial, if that's what we're, you know, if we're focusing on that uh, and also people's just general well-being. And I think, again, that empathy thing that we talked about, talking about really listening not hearing people listening it's a yeah. completely different thing and i think we we just need to tap into that more and more and, and you know be passionate about what we do help people be motivated encourage people to be tenacious and you know there will be opportunities out there and they're going to be a bit different from some of the opportunities that have been there before but but it'll just take that bit longer yeah i agree um well i can tell you are passionate about your businesses a hundred percent um so your clients for your consultancy are they are they entrepreneurs that want to scale up are they sort of larger brands that that we would have heard of um or is it a mixture um it is a mixture so on the larger side of things for example i did some work for ge global where i was looking at um their next uh, cohort of uh, global senior management and I had them doing a sort of uh, dragon's den type thing um, and um, really talking to them about motivation and leadership um, and idea generation so I've worked with a number of law firms as well in that vein mm-hmm. about retention of, of staff how do you do that how do you be a good leader how do you how do you encourage your employees to be courageous and share ideas and all of that sort of so so that's one of the sort of, so those are examples of larger clients um but also in terms of um mentoring and people with concepts and ideas i've done a lot of work with budding entrepreneurs um who are wondering what the first step to take should be and what's going to happen how to raise the money what to you know actually also sometimes how to stay motivated what 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 they should do to take it forward and sort of everything in between so medium-sized enterprises, um, and that could be looking at their brand range. It could be looking, as I say, at things like exporting, um, whether that's a good idea, expansion, um, sometimes uh, contracting a range. Um, but then so often you'll go in with one thing and you'll end up talking about other things as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, and, uh, you know, we're all, we're all, at the end of the day, people, individuals, and so often it will come down to you know uh looking at that sort of motivation and um things like that as well so so it's it's all in in between right from an idea and someone doing what i did an idea from in your head to in the shop to a you know a huge global company looking at who their next leaders are going to be so awesome. all, all and everything in between 
so what's what does the future hold for you oh more of that i hope um uh, i hope to continue to um expand my you know my contacts and and to ensure that that i'm doing more of that sort of thing i have recently started doing more and engaging more in young enterprise um i've been a mentor before but all sorts of people who've been wanting to take ideas forward and i for example had students working for me and all that sort of thing but i really think in the next well 12 to 18 months those you know, young adults who are coming out of school who are hoping to go to university who are going to be looking for jobs I think we mustn't forget that their entrepreneurial skill is absolutely something that we need to tap into. So just ensure that um, I share my knowledge, not only with those who are already doing things, but with those who might do the thing of the future. Excellent. Thank you very much. OK, we're coming to the end of the interview. I asked the same six questions to all of my guests. Um, they are quick fire questions. They don't need a quick fire answer. It depends on what you, how, what you want to share with me. So the first one is, what's the best decision that you made? OK, that's an issue. The best decision. The best decision was probably actually to have the courage to leave my legal job. That was a big deal. It was a good job and I enjoyed it and I worked with nice people, but I don't think I ever could have achieved what I achieved and tried to work uh, in a career like that at the same time. But it was the best background. So, right. uh, What's the best advice you've been given? Oh, employ people who know more than you. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, who's the person that's helped you most in your career? You can give a few shout outs if you want. Yeah, I, yes, I think, well, my husband actually has been very helpful. I think he's been, oh gosh, he's been very, very patient with all of this. Um, so he's been um, absolutely amazing. Um, who else was, in, in terms of my <laughs> career going forward, in terms of the stuff I do now, um, a lovely, lovely lady called Linda helped me hugely when I started um, going out and doing my manufacturing. She had a background in, in manufacturing children's products. Um, so she was absolutely amazing. Um, I'd say Man King was pretty useful. <laughs> <laughs> he really Sounds like he saved your business well, when it was getting really everything knew ready. What, what, how to take an <laughs> idea. Um, so yeah, so I suppose the three of them were, were, were really instrumental. Uh, do you have any regrets? Um, do I have any regrets? I, I sometimes regret the fact that I probably wasn't at home enough for a lot of years. Actually, I slightly regret that. Mm. And um, I, when I say regret, I think it's more just a sort of um, pensive yearning. They've grown up so quickly. You know, everyone always says to you, oh, you know, they grow so quickly and it'll be in a heartbeat. But now I look back you know and I think oh you know eight years of, of, of not really being at home much so I think a better balance might have been a good thing and actually going forward for quite a lot of the people that, that I talked to who are in the early stages I don't think it's a bad thing to have a business partner actually okay, okay. I think it's quite lonely being yeah. being a sole you know owner entrepreneur founder is is it's very hard because ultimately as good as your employees are and they can be absolutely amazing and you can motivate them and bring them along that the, the buck stops with you and it's a huge burden sometimes and that's why sometimes so i talk a lot about having coaches and mentors for yourself yeah. because that's a safe zone that that you you have outside of your employees or the people that are involved in your project and so that's why i talk very heavily that people should think about having coaches and mentors in yes their lives. and i think that's maybe one of the reasons why I get so much out of doing that mm. because it would have been fantastic to have had this a similar you know and I'm not saying people weren't of course they were people were encouraging and uh, and and what have you but I think it is it is a it's a it's a quite a lonely journey being a founder entrepreneur so yeah. that have a business partner it's quite a good idea if you can find the right one yes <laughs> um what are you most proud of you know I'm I'm proud of actually having made real things from scratch that people wanted to buy and being able to 
stick it out and actually make it happen. Um, because I think it took, you know, it was, it, I'm, I'm proud that I was courageous enough to do it. Awesome. Uh, what does legacy mean to you? Legacy means the things that we've talked about during this podcast and the, the areas where I might have been, you know, where it, it could have been easier, maybe having a, a business partner, helping people avoid the pitfalls. I think legacy is helping people to have a journey themselves, hopefully without as much trouble and strife as I found along the way, not having enough knowledge, um, but also hoping that people, when I leave the room, they feel enthusiastic, motivated, energized and courageous and that that lasts with them for them to move forward. Brilliant. Um, and lastly, where can people find you if they want to reach out to you? Uh, they can find me at Inspirational Solutions. So that's inspirationalsolutionsltd.com. And they can always find me on LinkedIn as well. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your time. I think you, you've, you, you for me, are hugely passionate, hugely courageous, making some of those decisions that you did to, to do, and and tenacious. You you wouldn't let it go. So 